Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, today we continue solving problems. In this particular case, we will go into algebra. So this is algebra number five. Um, this is part of the course called Math Plus and Problems, presented on Unizor.com. So the whole course is dedicated to solving problems. There is a prerequisite course, which is Math for Teens. Uh, on the same website. By the way, all courses are totally free, no advertisement, no strings attached. So, obviously, all these problems which I present in Mass Plus and Problems course are related to theoretical material presented in this previous course, Mass for Teens. Um, now, I have divided problems into different categories, basically algebra, arithmetic, logic, geometry, etc. Um, now, the problems are not really related to each other, so you can solve all these problems in the course Math Plus and, and, pro math plus and Problems in whatever order you want. There is no like, theor uh, like theoretical consequence from one to another. Um, so, well, that's it. So let's just solve uh, these couple of uh, algebra problems. Um, my suggestion is um, go to the website unizor.com and um, each lecture is presented in two formats the video format like you're watching right now and there is a textual format right next to it next to the video so on the same screen you basically see a video presentation and textual part which is basically like a textbook and I present exactly the same problems, sometimes with the solution, sometimes without the solution, maybe with some hints. Uh, I present them in the textual problem. So I suggest you to read the textual problem first and think about it. What's most important is to think about these problems. It's good if you can solve it yourself. But in any case, if you just listen to whatever I'm uh, explaining, like a solution to problems, well, I mean, I'm sure it, it, it's good practice, but that's not the purpose of the course. The purpose of the course is for you to solve these problems, and I'm just helping you with some hints, maybe, etc. Now, if you are watching the lecture, it makes sense, actually, to make a pause right after I explain what is the problem, before I started explaining its solution. And again, try to solve the problems yourself. Whether you succeed or not doesn't really matter. Well, it does matter, but it's not really important. What's important is you to think about these problems. And that's what actually is the purpose of the whole course, to encourage you to think about the problems, attempting to solve it, obviously. OK. Uh, I have three algebra problems. So let me just start from, from the first one. So there is a. A system of two uh, equations. A is some number. X, Y, and Z are unknown variables. So their sum is equal to A, and sum of their reciprocities is equal to reciprocity of A. Kind of a strange combination. Now, I have only two equations, and I'm not asking you to solve, because there are only two equations with three unknowns. It cannot be solved. However, there is something which we can say about variables x, y, and z. You have to prove, basically, that one of them, x or y or z, is equal to capital A. Just looking at this, you have to really make such a logical um, connection that one of them, x, y, or z, is supposed to be equal to a. Okay, so again, that's the basically time where you can pause. Now, um, let me start solving the problem. And again, you can stop the video at any point and just think about further saying basically, oh, I know how to continue solving this problem. So feel free to do that. So what I'm doing is, first of all, 
let's just assume that one of them is not equal to A, obviously. And we will come to some kind of uh, result which you will see. Now, first of all, none of them is equal to zero, obviously, because they are in the denominator. So we know that. I mean, that's just from the condition. X not equal to zero, Y not equal to zero, Z not equal to zero, and A not equal to zero. OK, fine. So otherwise, we will not be able to, to do this reciprocity. Now, next, what I will do is, well, let's assume z is not equal to a, to a. I mean, if all of them are equal to a, by the way, none of it's it's impossible for all of them to be equal to a, obviously, right? Because then it's just invalid um, uh, conditions would be. But okay, let's assume that z is not equal to a. So what I will do, I will put z on the right. So next system would be x, y, x and y is a minus z, and 1x plus 1y is 1a minus 1z. Okay, now, uh, this is something which I don't really like. I will just do this common denominator thing. So instead of this, I will put common denominator is x, y. This would be y plus x, or x plus y, equals to this common denominator, az. It will be z minus a. OK, so I will replace this with this. It's equivalent. Now, I know this condition. So I can substitute it into this, and I will have a minus z divided by xy equals to z minus a divided by a times z, right? Now, a minus z and z minus a, right? So I can always have reduce them. I assume z is not equal to a, so I will put 1 here, minus 1 here, and plus here. Okay, so I just reduce it by a minus z. It was a minus z here and z minus a here, so that's why it's minus one. Now I can reverse it, and I will have that x y is equal to minus a z. And that's basically everything which I need right now. X y is equal to minus a z. Okay. Now, here is a very interesting observation which I would like to make. If you have a quadratic equation, let's call it x squared plus px plus q equals to 0. It has two roots. Now, there is a very easy to prove theorem that two solutions, x1 and x2, their sum is equal to minus p, and their product is equal to q. Now, I did address this particular property of quadratic equations in the prerequisite course mass uh, for teens, where I discussed the quadratic equations. Now, in the textual part of this lecture, I, speci I, I, I specify exactly what is the lecture name and whatever the uh, the menu items you have to go through to, to get to this lecture. But it's very easy actually to prove even if you will take the formula for uh, solutions of a quadratic equation of this type and you will see that their sum is equal to minus, some of the uh, solutions will be minus, uh, minus uh, p and uh, the product will be uh, equal to q. So I assume that this is the property which is known it was dis uh, discussed in one of the earliest, uh, earlier rect lectures. So I'll just use this property. Now, what follows from this? Well, what follows is that if you have another equation, let's say y squared plus py plus q is equal to 0, it also has two solutions, one y, uh, y and y2. 
Now, solutions to these two are supposed to be exactly the same, right? So it's either x1 equals to y1 and x2 equals to y2, or x1 is equal to y2 and x2 is equal to y1, right? Uh, this is true, sorry. So, if you have the same quadratic equations, they have to have exactly the same um, roots. And the roots are completely defined by this property. So, let me just go back to, to this. What follows from this is the following. And this is a very important logical kind of thing. If you have x plus y is equal to a plus b, and x, y is equal to a times b. Now, what actually it means? It means that x and y are roots of the same equation as a and b, since their sum is the first coefficient with a minus sign, and the product is the uh, free member of the quadratic equation, which I was using, like minus p and q. So they are supposed to be roots of the same equation, which means it's either S, uh, x is equal to a, a and y is equal to b, or x is equal to b and y is equal to a. It's one of those two variations, right? So that's what's very important. Now, if, again, if you have this property, you have this property, because both x and y and a and b are solutions to the same quadratic equation uh, which we can put x um, uh, plus px plus q is equal to zero with p is equal to minus a plus b and q is equal to a b which is the same as minus x plus y and uh, x times y so since some of them is the same and product is the same, they are solutions to the same quadratic equations, and that's why I, they are supposed to be equal, either first to first and second to second, or first to second and second to first. Okay, great. This is basically the end of the proof, because, as you see, if I will put A is equal to capital A and B is equal to minus Z, I will have that x plus y is equal to a plus b, a plus b, right, a to z, and x, y is equal to a times b, a minus z product, which means that either x is equal to a and y is equal to b, and a is capital A and b is minus z, or x is equal to minus z and a is equal to capital A which is exactly what we wanted to prove that one of those either x or y are equal to a in the beginning I suggested that maybe z is not equal to a well if some other variable is not equal to a we will do exactly the same thing instead of z we will we'll use another variable but basically the whole um, uh, I, I, the, the whole, whole, whole uh, meaning, actually, of the whole problem is, is this. So if you have sum of two variables equal to sum of the others and product is equal to product, then they are supposed to be the same. I mean, they're pair. Either this is equal to this and this to that, or vice versa. So that's what's very important. The sum and the product of two variables totally define them, at least as a pair. Okay, number two. Number two is to prove the inequality. Okay. So we have to prove that x plus y to the fourth less than or equal ax4 plus 8 y to the fourth. Now we have to prove this inequality. All right. So how can we prove it? Well, first of all, I would like to simplify it. 
um, if y is equal to 4, uh, sorry, to, to 0, then it would be x to the 4 minus 8 times x to the 4. It will be obvious uh, inequality because x is a positive, x to the 4th is a positive or not negative actually number. So if y is equal to 0, what follows is obvious inequality. This is not negative. So obviously, if it's zero, then it's uh, obvious uh, equality. And if it's not zero, we just reduce by x4, and we will have one up less than eight. That that's uh, obvious. So that's okay. Now, <coughs> um, so we assume that y is not equal to zero. Now, the plan which I'm going to go through is I will um, transform this equation uh, into equivalent one and then another and another and another until I will see the obvious uh, obviously true equation or in equation now since all my transformations were equivalent they are going in both directions, from A follows B and from B follows A. So I will do only equivalent transformations. Then I can say that my end statement, which is obviously true, can be, can be used as a starting point, and then I go all the way up back to the original statement. So it's analysis and the proof. Analysis is from whatever you have to prove you go down to something which is obvious, that's analysis, and then the real proof is to start from the obviously true statement, and then using logical transformation, equivalent transformation, you go back to your statement which you have to prove. So that's the plan. All right, so my first transformation, since y is not equal to zero, I can divide both sides by strictly positive y is equal to force. So what, would I, what, what would I, will I have? I have x over y plus 1 to the fourth. I have to prove that this is x to the y to the fourth plus 8. Now, why did I do this? It just seems to be a little easier because I can always say that x over y is equal to t. And basically, this is t plus 1 to the fourth less than 8t to the fourth plus 8. It looks simpler because it's only one argument rather than two, x and y. So that's easier for me. All right, that's kind of a thing which I, I, I did it without knowing what will be further on. OK, next, obviously, my point is uh, I have to somehow transform it into more, well, adequate kind of a form. So more adequate is just polynomial uh, of t. So I will just open the parentheses and uh, it would be t plus 1 to the fourth. I'll just multiply t plus 1 to the second, which is t squared plus 2t plus 1, and then multiply these two by themselves, and that will give you the result. Now, everything from the left part, I will go to the right, so I will have uh, something on the right, which I will get from here, so I'm not going to do this in detail, so I'll just give you the final formula. Okay, now t plus 1 to the fourth would be t to the fourth plus 4t to the cube plus 6t squared plus 4 um, and, uh, uh, and then I will subtract this from this part and that's what I will get here. Right, t to the fourth plus four t to the cube plus c t squared plus four t plus one, and if I will transfer it to this one, and the first and the second would be seven and seven. Everything else is left with a minus sign. Okay, correct. So I have to prove this. Well, again, it's not obvious. However, 
and this is something which is well something which you really have to come up with from some kind of a inspiration look at this sum of these coefficients equals 7 minus 4 it's 3 minus 6 minus 3 minus 4 is minus 7 plus 7 0 now what does it mean that the sum of the coefficients is equal to 0 well it means that if I will put t is equal to 1 then the result of substituting would be 0 right if t is equal to 1 I will have just some of these coefficients and that's 0 okay that's great so t is equal to 1 is a root of the equation this one is equal to 0 now there is a something which is called fundamental theorem of algebra and again in the previous course mass 14 I explained it. if some kind of a polynomial p of n degree of let's say x has root x equals to a then this polynomial is divisible by x minus a and the polynomial of degree one less than this so this is um, the the, the uh, one of this uh, one of the consequences of the fundamental theorem of algebra fundamental theorem of, of algebra actually says that, that any polynomial of the nth degree has n complex roots and one of the uh, the, the first corollary corollary of actually of this theorem is that if a is a root it's divisible by x minus a now t is equal to 1 is a root so this thing is divisible by t minus by, by t minus 1 so it can be represented as t minus 1 times something so let me just do it 7 minus minus 4 t cube minus c t square minus 4 t plus 7 if I will divide it by t minus 1 7 t 4 so it's 7 t cube cube it's 7 t 4 minus 7 t cube times 1 subtract would be 3 t cube minus 6 t square would be plus 3 t square right am I right let me check so it would be 3 t cube minus 3 t square subtract would be minus 3 t square minus 4 t would be minus 3 t minus 3 t times 3 t square plus 3 t would be minus 7 t plus 7 and it would be minus 7 so as a result this is equal to t minus 1 times 7 t cubed my plus 3t square minus 3t minus 7 this is supposed to be greater than or equal to 0 so I'll just represent this as a product of these two now again 7 plus 3 10 minus 3 minus 7 minus 10 at 0 again so again t is equal to 1 is the root of this one and I can divide it again by t minus 1 and so what will be would be t minus 1 square and this is t minus 1 this which that's why this is square and some uh, quadratic equation and I will give you the result because I have already done this it's just a simple division okay so I represented this as a product of these how because I noticed that the one is the root of this equation and then root of the result of the division by t minus 1 which means it's divisible by t minus 1 again that's why it's t minus 1 square great now this is greater than equal to 0 because it's a square right now this is a quadratic polynomial 
its discriminant, which is b square minus 4ac, b square is 100, minus 4 times 7 and 7, 4 times 49, uh, whatever it is, uh, it's uh, nine, minus 96, right? So this is negative. When discriminant is negative, there are no real uh, solutions to a quadratic equation, which means it's always either above or below the x-axis on the graph. Well, in this case, it's above because the first coefficient is positive, 7. So it, it's a parabola which goes with its horns up, and it goes above the x-axis because there are no solutions, no roots. So this is also positive. So this is positive, well, not ne this is not negative, and this is just positive, basically. And that's why this last equation is obvious. Since it's obvious, then all my transformations are totally equivalent. So I can say that if this is consequent, then this is, uh, if this is obvious, then this is true, and this is true, and this is true, and this is true, and this is true. So that's the end of the proof. Again, what I did before was analysis. Proof is from here back to the original, from obviously true statement to the one which you, you would like to prove. Okay, and the next problem. Also, prove the inequality. That's uh, x to the 12 minus x to the 9 plus x to the 4 minus x plus 1 greater than, no, just strictly greater than 0. We have to prove it. Okay, fine. Let's just consider this particular polynomial. Now, this is x to the 9 times x to the cube minus 1, right? x to the 9, I um, factor out, so I will have 12 minus 9 is 3, and this is 1, plus x times x to the cube minus 1. x factor out, x cubed is minus 1. Now, x, min x to the cube minus 1 again, Well, I can actually, instead of x9 times x, I can put x8 plus 1 and x, right? Okay, now, let's talk about graph of this thing. Graph is something, whatever. Now, these are roots of the polynomial, where it's equal to 0, right? Now. What are the roots of this? This doesn't have any uh, uh, roots under no circumstances. This one is equal to 0. This is equal to 0 at 0, and this is equal to 0 at 1. So basically, we have only two roots. So my graph is supposed to go something like this. This is 0, this is 1. Um, now, the on 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 greater than 1 and less than 0, it's supposed to be positive, obviously. If you will put a large positive number, it will be positive. So it's somewhere here, somewhere here, and somewhere here. So that's basically the graph. It's supposed to be in this particular area. Well, okay, fine. So it doesn't really matter what uh, the behavior of this function less than 0 and greater than 1. We have to only consider this particular uh, interval from 0 to 1, right? Okay. So outside of this interval, I know that this thing is positive, so plus 1 will be definitely positive. Well, not negative, and in the in plus 1 will be definitely uh, positive. So there is no problem with outside of this interval. So let's consider only within this interval from 0 to 1. Now, that's easy. From 0 to 1, I will transform it a little bit differently. x12 mm, plus x to the fourth, 1 minus x to the 5. x to the fourth, x to the 9, combined together, x to the fourth, 
uh, outside of parentheses. So I'll have 1, which is x4, and minus x5 would be minus x9. Plus, in this as well, I will put in brackets, in parentheses. Now, I'm talking about only interval from 0 to 1, right? Which means this is um, non-negative, and this is non-negative. And obviously x12 is also not negative. So, basically everything is non-negative, here, here, and here. This is non-negative, 1 minus x minus 5 on this interval, if x is less than 1, and the same is here. So that's how this is greater than 0. I mean, if you wish, the only thing which kind of are iffy is endpoints, 0 and 1. Well, if it's 0, then it's 1 is greater, and if it's 1, that would be 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, and 1 again, 1. So in both cases, uh, our uh, inequality has been proven. Okay, that's it. Um, thank you very much, and uh, I suggest you to uh, read the notes for this lecture. There are some, you know, solutions presented. And think, think, and think. Try to think about each problem again, even before you read the solutions. Okay, good luck.